Hey, oh, welcome everyone to episode 50 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this is a big milestone for us here. We're recording our 50th episode, and it just happens to fall on the same week as our one year anniversary. So I just want to say thank you to everyone that's been following along and has subscribed and shared what we're doing here. We do it for you. Um, this week, we are going to be talking to Stevie, the owner of Nine Finger Games and the creator of Zappling Bygone. Stevie has been uh, showing up all over my Reddit and Twitter feed. So I had to investigate. After a little bit of digging, I found this game, and it looks awesome. And I noticed that he launched a Kickstarter, so I decided I had to help him fund that. A lot of other people did. Um, so let's talk to Stevie now about Zappling Bygone. How are you doing today, Stevie? I'm good, thanks. I'm, I'm good. Uh, so yeah, I'm Stevie, um, solo developer of Zappling Bygone. Uh, just finished the Kickstarter about a week ago. Um, got 130% funding, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I can tell you a bit more about the game if you like. Yeah, we'll jump into that. Um, before we do, I just wanted to say, um, if you like what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, don't forget to subscribe, share, and like if you're on YouTube or on the podcast. And we did launch a Patreon. So if you want to support us there, we really appreciate it. It'll help us to continue to improve the show as well as potentially get some merch in the future. Um, so yeah, Stevie, like you said, about the game. Let's jump into Zappling Bygone. I've played the beta, can't wait for the full release. Just tell me a little bit more, the listeners, um, about the character story, the gameplay, and what you can expect when you actually play this game. Okay, so it's a pixel art Metroidvania inspired by, obviously, Hollow Knight and Celeste. Um, it's about an alien hive mind that lands on a planet after leaving uh, his own planet, and he's basically tasked to repopulate. So he doesn't know anything about the planet, nor does the user, nor does the player. Um, and your task is to repopulate. So you kind of explore the world and try and see if it's habitable. Um, the kind of the interesting part about Zappling is because he's a hive mind, when he kills a boss, he then equips his skull and that unlocks new abilities, but it also allows you to communicate with the boss you just killed. So you can communicate with the boss that you just killed meaning when you're just after you've killed him he opens up a way more dialogue with between you and the boss as you explore so for instance um one of the bosses you kill in the demo is the rat king once you kill that boss he can then give you all the information and all the the lore about his kingdom and what how, how it how it came to be and kind of ended up how he died and all, all that all that juicy lore um, that kind of happens with every boss you kill. Um, so the kind of the 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 loop, the gameplay loop would be you explore a zone, you kill the boss, you learn all the lore of the boss and all of the environment, and then you move on to kill the next boss. And that all kind of evolves into a big over, overarching story that um, I think is compelling, <laughs> but we'll see. I don't know if I answered your question, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I think that's totally fine. I mean, you, you went into the character and everything. Um, I guess one thing that I'm always interested in is how the idea comes to be. I mean, you see all these games that are so interesting and you're like, wow, how would I have thought of that? How did anybody think of that? And I'm curious as to how you came up with the idea as well as anybody that's listening to the podcast. I'm going to throw a video up here of a, a nine-year-old storyboarding this game. Was that you it's my nephew. by chance? That's your nephew? Okay. <laughs> my nephew. Um, so just tell me a little bit about the story behind um, having him kind of read the storyboard out as well as um, how you came up with the idea for the game. Okay, so the I, I basically came to my nephew um, after I'd already started making the game and he was interested in kind of games development and things like that. He wants to be a games designer when he's older. So I gave him, I just basically, I didn't want to intervene too much. I just said, come back to me next week with like a drawing of a boss and just some, inf some information and I just left it at that and then a week later or two weeks later he comes back with that and i'm obligated to put it in the game <laughs> it turned out great i like it um it also kind of adds to the lore of the game because it wasn't very specific which is a good thing which means i can actually adapt it to make the law to fit the law of the game um that was cool and anyway, when it came when it comes to the um to the idea for the game in general it's kind of um i'm not sure if i'm the same when it as other developers, but I kind of let it evolve as when, when I first started the game, it was just a basic platformer like Hollow Knight. Like it was pretty much that I started the game 
just to see if I could make platforming feel as good as Hollow Knight and Celeste. And that was about as much information I had when I started. Um, and then things kind of evolve and you get more ideas and you add more um, more abilities and more lore and it kind of becomes its own thing. It doesn't feel like I'm making the game. It more feels like the game's kind of making itself and I'm along for the ride. And that's makes it way more interesting as a developer when I don't really know how it's going to end. I kind of have a broad structure of story and a broad structure of zones, but the intricate details, I don't, I honestly don't know. Um, it just kind of evolves itself. I think that's good. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that because you see a lot of games where people are so structured. Like I know I spoke with uh, the team behind uh, Highlight Heroes and they said that they had everything planned out and structured and ready to go and then they executed on it. You went mm -hmm. the opposite route and kind of like, I just want to see if I can make something like this. And then as it evolves, I'll keep adding and adding and adding and adding. That's, that's awesome. I love the, the organic structure of that game. Um, and as someone who is part of a development team, but I don't do any of the coding or any of the art, I'm curious for other developers that are watching the show, what were some of your largest obstacles that you encountered um, through the process of making the game? Largest obstacles. I'm terrible at UI. <laughs> I'm not good at UI. You can probably tell from the game. I'm trying my best. Um, and I was kind of getting better and better and learning more. But UI is something I'm bad at. Like, not only because I'm like not very good when it comes to um, like usability and accessibility and stuff. Um, I'm also like visually and the, the amount of effort that goes into the visuals of the UI is something that I'm very new to. Um, so that's probably the biggest challenge so far. It doesn't sound like something that should be challenging, but it, it is. It's hard to get right. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm overhauling all of that in the main game's development. It's one of the things I'm doing now. Um, any other obstacles? Uh, marketing is hard. Marketing is something that you have to learn and you have to really put effort into. And it's something that I, I was completely new to. Um, but you, you kind of get you, you get an understanding of what works and what doesn't work. And it's not as simple as following a tutorial like it is with coding. Uh, it's it's very kind of free form and you have to kind of think of new ideas yourself um, for marketing and kind of the, the best thing that resonates because every game's different and every audience is different. So you have to find what resonates um, uniquely to your project. And that's something that's really hard. That was definitely an obstacle. <laughs> yeah, I like how that actually unintentionally led exactly into my next question, which is um, you jumped into Kickstarter and I pitched in on that and I thought there were other, a lot of other people that pitched in on that Kickstarter as well. You ended Thank up hitting you. what, like three of your stretch goals or something like that. It was like mm -hmm. an extra 10% um, for every stretch goal basically. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you give tips to other developers as to how to start to build that following and how to actually launch a successful Kickstarter? Yep. It's hard. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, so before the Kickstarter, probably a month before it launched, I done a lot of studying. I done a lot of research online, just YouTube videos. Um, there's a, a lot of kind of data out there now that you can kind of go through to find out about Kickstarter and, and what you need to succeed. Um, but the harder part isn't running the Kickstarter, it's getting the following and getting people interested in your game initially before you start Kickstarter. Because if you launch Kickstarter with zero following, it's very likely that it won't succeed. So gaining a following is obviously the most important thing, but it's also something that's hard. Um, you need to make something that people are interested in. That's kind of <laughs> the sum of it. If you make something and you're posting on Twitter and it's getting a lot of exposure, but you're not getting any followers or you're posting on Reddit and it's not getting downvoted, but it's just not getting any exposure or not getting. So you post something on Twitter and you use all the right hashtags and the gameplay is good and you're really happy with it, but it just doesn't get any retweets, doesn't get any likes. You, you should learn from that. Either the, either the media you're putting out isn't great or the game itself isn't compelling. If you run a Kickstarter and it fails, it doesn't mean the game's bad. It could be, mean that the Kickstarter was bad um, or not correctly structured or there's loads of intricate details that could have gone wrong. But remember, it can also be the game that not, not isn't bad, but couldn't sell 
because game on Kickstarter, what you're doing really, you're selling the game in advance. You're kind of pre-ordering it. Um, and if your Kickstarter gets a lot of views and a lot of exposure, but not many backers, take a look at your game itself um, and see what's wrong with it that you can improve. I, I don't know if I answered that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you talked about like the intricacies that are involved in the Kickstarter and building that following and. You're totally right. I mean, if, if there's not a lot of interaction with your post or follows, then it's probably not compelling enough for someone to continue to follow the progress of the game. Um, and I think you did a good job because, I mean, I've been following it for a few months now and it's been kind of slow progression on the game. You're showing like new level designs, new characters, new skulls, things like that. Um, and since this Kickstarter was successful and you now reach three of your stretch goals, um, you have more stuff to work on before you release the game. <laughs> So give, them, give us an idea of kind of like what your stretch goals were, which ones you hit, and what your process is moving forward to the actual release. OK. Um, so the stretch goals were something that, before the Kickstarter launched, I knew how much money it was going to cost to make the game. And that was way higher than it was, than um, the initial goal was. And that was because I hadn't cut anything out. So what I basically did is I cut everything out of the game to make it kind of the minimum viable product and then then i worked out how much it would cost to make that product and then separate the other stuff to set to stretch goals um when i say minimum viable product that makes it sound like there's no content there is content but there's no extra things that i just really wanted to add um i removed that stuff and put it in the stretch goals um that's kind of how you get your the cost of the game to be as low as possible because you don't know how much funding you're going to get on kickstarter um and obviously the lower the goal the more likely you would succeed so you want to so that's what i did i took all the the non-essential parts of the game out and put them in stretch goals three of them were the game modes that actually got um funded which is great so i really want to add them but i had to take them out but thank god then the the stretch goals are reached so i can do them one of them is, or the first one is Metal Face Mode. That is MF Doom inspired, obviously. Um, and that means it's a skull that you get right at the beginning of the game and you can't remove it, you can't take it off. And if you die, death is permanent. It's kind of basically a hardcore mode, um, an Iron Man mode or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the next stretch goal is, I can't remember which order I'd done them in. Yeah, it's the randomizer. The next one is the randomizer, and that is, it's like a, the Hollow Knight randomizer, but not as insane, not as intense as the mod. And basically, what it does, it it changes the locations of all the charms in the game, um, changes some rooms, um, any room that can that isn't essential to the story and essential to progression can swap about and move. Um, and it's basically a way that you can um, play the game to add replayability where not everything's going to be the same. Like some enemies can swap positions, basically something that makes the game more interesting for second or third playthroughs. And the final stretch goal that I reached was, uh, my mind's gone blank. Oh, um, Explorer mode is what I'm calling it. It's it basically op like Metroidvania game design is you find an area that you can't, actually progress to yet because you need a new ability and you get that ability then you can progress to that air new area that you couldn't before um for this game mode i've come and I've completely got rid of that and made it completely open world so you can go it's kind of like dark souls if you played that where you can go to really hard areas way before you're meant to um and explore the area and actually probably die a lot um, until you realize it's actually this area is well, not for me, this is way too hard at the moment. And then you go back to the other areas. So what it does is it opens up the whole world initially right at the start and you can go wherever you want. It kind of, it's anti-Metroidvania mode, you, you might want to call it. Um, so yeah, and all them game modes can be added or played in any order or any com combination. So you could be hardcore mode, explorer mode and randomizer all at the same time. Um, which can create some really cool um, get playthroughs, I suppose. And the, sorry, there is one more um, stretch goal that I added. Um, and that stretch goal is, it's one that didn't get achieved during the Kickstarter, but I was really passionate about, so I am decided to throw it in anyway. And that is, there's gonna be comic strips, like digital comic strips in the game that you can f discover each panel for 
in the respective zones. So each boss, for instance, would have a comic strip page that tells its own story about how it came to be and all the lore and stuff. And then each panel you would find scattered around like and you'd find them through exploration and it's like a puzzle and it adds it up and then you can read the whole story as a comic strip in the game and that's it that's all of them <laughs> there's a whole long-winded explanation <laughs> yeah no that's that's a really cool addition that comic book strip and the other stuff i mean is awesome like that's that's a really good way to make the game fun to play over and over and over and have different difficulties and abilities and i love the comic strip, uh, strip idea just because like it is such it's so ingrained in nerd culture, like to have that mm -hmm. comic book. Um, and it's, it's really cool to get rewarded for searching through those areas, as opposed to like finding more health, you like actually get something to check out and learn the lore of the game. Um, I guess one other thing, like the last question I have about Kickstarter, I know I've, I've asked a bunch of them, um, but that is your tiers. I'm curious as to how you set up your tiers and what you felt rewards were worth. Cause I think I, I pitched in like 25 American, something like that. So um, US or USD. So I get like the game and I think an extra mask or something like that. What were your your different tiers and how did you determine which ones to uh, make at that price point? Uh -huh. So it's not something you want to say to backers really, but it's something kind of essential to do if you want to be able to fund your game is you want to choose tiers that kind of in make you want make the user want to choose the next tier and then up slightly higher and up slightly higher um because obviously they're getting rewarded for the tiers and they're all optional um but you, you want to basically space them out so the next one is more enticing than the previous but only slightly so and then when you get that next tier you're like hmm what about that next tier and it's, it's kind of just it's it's just sales structure i suppose when you're trying to entice them to pay a little bit more and a little bit more to get the better the better thing um if you're thinking about doing a kickstarter and you you're thinking of doing physical rewards and you're not working with a publisher that's going to um or a company that's going to sort all that out for you i recommend doing what i did and that is have a very limited set of physical rewards like the mugs for instance from zaplin bygone the kickstarter are there's only 20 of them going to be made and they're literally numbered on the mug so that means you can charge more for them and they're actually i think they're really cool because they're really limited and you know ne i'm never going to make more of them um but it also means that i'm not going to have to ship out a thousand mugs i only have to ship out 20 mugs um and that keeps costs low and it's more kind of bang for your buck i suppose um and all the money i'm getting is obviously going into the game it's going straight into the kicks into the development of the game so um a better game is going to come out of these kind of techniques um so yeah is that good <laughs> yeah yeah that what was the original question <laughs> what were Tears. some of those rewards like what were the the cool rewards that you had in there so the digital rewards the the really cool ones are designing your own skull which is great i think that's really cool um that a couple of people chose i'm really grateful for um and they kind of send their description of the how they, the skull they want it to look like and what its kind of lore is and obviously if it's a skull it it means that there was a it belonged to something right which kind of has an impact in the law of the game which is really cool um obviously there's the the statue in the the hall of builders which is basically a shout out to the person where i would design their own statue and put it in a unique area in the game um what else was there t-shirts kind of self-explanatory similar to the mugs I can't think of any more off the top of my head, any more but super interesting ones anyway. Yeah, I know you were like putting people in the credits uh, if they back to a certain mm -hmm. level. I think I think that was the tier that I that I grabbed at. Um, yeah, I, I love the rewards. I think they're awesome. And I'm curious now about your gaming history. Um, everybody kind of has that like influential moment in their gaming history where they're like, I want to develop. I want to go into this. I want to be part of this scene. Um, I'm curious as to what your gaming history was like, where you started, and do you have that pivotal moment where you were like, I want to develop video games? When I was like 15 or 16 at college, I think um, Game Maker was installed on one of the computers and I was bored as hell in college, so I just kind of started playing around with it. Um, and for 
nearly like eight years after that it's just kind of been a little hobby where i would just um just play around with it and i wasn't really making games i suppose i was making games but what i was really doing is making game mechanics and not releasing them i was just making fun things um just out of kind of the enjoyment of doing it which was it was fun um so basically you'd call me a hobbyist at that point i suppose um fast forward to university and i studied game design i was going to study game design and then i quit in the first year because i i just wasn't enjoying it to be honest um it was something about the atmosphere um in game design that i didn't like i couldn't quite um couldn't quite get used to i still have, don't really know the reason why i quit that anyway but i switched over to web application development which is websites um online stuff and programming and just kind of more focused on programming is probably why i enjoyed it more um and from there i graduated i got a job in the gambling industry because i wanted to go into the gaming industry um but i wanted to live in birmingham as well and it was kind of the first interview i got and the first job i got um and that's for a gambling company um after working for the gambling company for like three years i kept getting like promotions and like good stuff but i wasn't happy um i wasn't happy in the gambling industry because of the ethical side of it that i didn't agree with but also the company itself i wasn't having a great time with i really loved the people um there were some really nice people um upper management and stuff was meh but really i, I just wasn't happy working in that industry so one day I was sad and I just quit and during the this was just before corona here I quit um and I quit initially to start making a game but not to release a game just because in the back of my mind I'm always kind of making fun little things and that's kind of what I, what I had in my head when I quit um that and traveling I was going to do that and travel when I, I just didn't know what I was going to do but I knew I wasn't happy what I was doing um where I was working so I quit. I and I was looking at traveling, thinking about doing that, and then Corona hit, and I was like, "Hmm, I guess I'll just carry on making this fun thing, this fun platforming thing I'm making." And then a year later, it's turned into Zapping Bygone, and here I am. <laughs> I'd like to say that I planned it all out, but nope. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I really appreciate that. I was in a similar situation where I was working a, a job that had a good a good path in it, and it just it was destroying me. I mean, mentally, so I, I had to get out, and everything just kind of fell in place from there. Um, I'm curious still about your background with gaming. So, kind of go into your history. Where did you start? What are some of the earliest games you remember playing? Um, obviously you've mentioned things like Shovel Knight and Celeste, like being big influences for this game. Um, but just give us kind of a rundown of your, your gaming history. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is going to sound weird cause I haven't, I, I wasn't really inspired by many Metroidvanias apart from Hollow Knight when I first started this project. Um, but from a young age, it was time splitters. It was, Anything, anything with a map editor thinking about it. I had Age of Mythology on like on like a really old PC where I would um I would use the map editor and just kind of add new maps and play new maps and then and then the next thing I could do that one on was Time Splitters two I think or three because it had a map editor and I just really enjoyed adding stuff to the maps and trying to make my own maps i think the editor was terrible thinking back and i never really been able to make anything good but it was just fun having my own influence on it and then it was halo and forge <laughs> where i could kind of make my own maps and my own game modes which was really fun so and then terraria as well 2015 i think um and terraria was again i ended up making my own mods and my own maps so it, it, thinking back, it kind of, I either make some, I either play games where you can have your influence in the game as like a map editor or um, or easily moddable and things like that, or I play a really competitive game. It's kind of that or one or the other. It's so like Overwatch, um, some MOBAs, Smite. So either competitive or a game that I can like be creative in. And yeah, I think that's probably it. Yeah, I mean, that makes a ton of sense if that's what you end up 
doing and making games like why wouldn't you have started in those editors and forge i'm with you i've spent a lot of hours in forge <laughs> making stuff and just making dumb game modes that you just play on on a land hookup um i guess the last question i have for you is when can we expect the full release for zapping bygone uh on steam because i think that's where you're releasing it originally right mm -hmm. um and then do you have any plans of porting that out to like switch xbox playstation things like that so Release is likely quarter one or quarter two, 2022. Um, please don't quote me on that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to release it before it's ready. And then I won't be pressured into doing that. I want to make a game that people are going to enjoy. Um, yeah. Uh, after PC, it's probably going to be, I'm going to be looking at funds to try and get it on Switch. I really, really want to put it on Switch, um, either through a publisher or just or if I have the funds just to do it myself, we'll see. Um, after that, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, or the, or next gen. Um, sorry, Xbox 360, PlayStation 4, um, or next gen. We'll see how that goes. Um, it all depends on funding, though. I want to put it everywhere, but I have to see how much I can afford and how much. If the game sells a lot on Steam and it gives me the funds to put it on Switch and put it on PlayStation and Xbox, then I really want to do that. Um, but my priority is PC, Switch, and then PlayStation or Xbox in that order. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, that sounds good. Obviously, we we don't want to pressure you into releasing it before it's ready. Um, but it is nice to know that, like, you are planning kind of early next year, giving yourself some time to, like, really fully develop this and produce the mm -hmm. best product you can. Um, last thing here is just throw out the social media links so that people can find you, check out the game, and continue to follow the progress. Awesome. Uh, okay. Uh, Twitter is... Nine Finger Games. Instagram is Nine Finger Games. <laughs> Nine with the the number, not the not not the word. Uh, that's my two main things: Twitter and Instagram. I have a Facebook page, but it's it's pretty dead. But uh, yeah, if you want to go like, follow on Facebook, that's Nine Finger Games as well. Ironically, um, I'm sure if you you'll put the the links in the description. If you do, that's great. Uh, and I just want to say thank you for the backing as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I will throw all those links down in the description so that they can find you. Um, and of course, I, I definitely want to support more indie developers and get creative games out. I feel like the the industry has gotten so sucked into this like hyper realistic, and I just there's just not a lot of big AAA games that interest me personally. I know other people mm -hmm. are interested, but. Um, yeah, that kind of wraps everything up here. I just want to say thank you, CV, again for coming on and talking about Zapling Pygon. Um, and anybody that's watching still, if you like what we're doing here, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. We appreciate it. And we are super excited to be doing this for a full year now, and we will continue on from here. But until next week, peace. Thank you.